I appreciate, uh, both Bernd and I appreciate uh, your professor, Gilmore, and also uh, John Cho, in the, the head of the Asian Studies here at City College, for uh, inviting us to speak to uh, you students. And we appreciate you students for the, the time uh, that uh, you give us to listen to our presentation. But what we're presenting to you is what happened in our, in our great country. But our government it kept it, uh, untold for decades. They kept it out of, our, out of our history books, they kept it out of our schools, and then they used euphemisms to, to hide what they were really doing. In fact, they put out a uh, propaganda film during World War II that said that uh, we were being relocated to new pioneer communities. And uh, we have maybe one or two slides here that shows you that uh, those weren't new pioneer communities, but, but flimsy barracks that we, were, uh, we had to live in. On December 7 of 1941, when Japan bombed our country, uh, 10 weeks afterwards, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which authorized the L Lieutenant General John DeWitt, the commander of the Western Defense Command, to imprison 120,000 Americans and legal residents in America's 10 concentration camps. I'll say a few things about the, 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 the terminology a little bit later too. <coughs> Let's see if we get this right. Our only crime was our face. We looked like the enemy that bombed our country. This is Lieutenant General John DeWitt. Sadly, he was an out-and-out -out racist. He said that the Japanese race was an enemy race. And if you, in fact, if you even have 1 16th the Japanese blood in you, you're apt to be loyal to Japan and not to our beloved America. When he posted his order in 1942 on telephone poles and walls of buildings because we didn't have television in those days. His order starts out, all persons of Japanese ancestry, both aliens and non-aliens, will be evacuated. Now, we know what an alien is. What's a non-alien? He didn't have the guts nor the integrity to at least write all aliens and American citizens. He called you non-aliens. There were 10 concentration camps uh, built in America, scattered in seven different states. Uh, most of us in Central California were shipped to south, uh, Southeast Arkansas. There are two concentration camps there. My wife was put in Arizona, a place called Poston. In 1998, the Immigration Museum in, in Ellis Island in New York, uh, they wanted a display of what had happened to us uh, in, the, in the museum. And so <clears throat> they asked the National Japanese American um, um, Japanese National American um, Museum in Los Angeles to come up with a display. And, and this is the display they, they um, built entitled America's Concentration Camps, Remembering the Japanese American Experience. And understandably, the Jewish groups in New York objected to the word concentration <laughs> camp. But the leaders of both the um, Jewish groups and the National Museum in LA 
uh, met together. After a couple hours, they come to the, came to the conclusion that that was a correct terminology, that, that they should use the word concentration camps to describe the camps that we were put into. But so that they would not uh, confuse the public, uh, they agreed to put a footnote in the display and also printed in the uh, program that was uh, distributed to those who attended. And th this is the footnote they put in. A concentration camp is a place where people are imprisoned, not because of any crimes they have committed, but simply because of who they are. The Nazi camps are places of torture, barbarous medical experiments, and summary executions. Some were extermination centers with gas chambers, but all had one thing in common. The people in power decided to remove a minority group from the general population, and the rest of the society let it happen. Our National Japanese American Citizens League recommends we use the correct terminology because <clears throat> um, the government used euphemisms. Uh, when, the, when the Oroville Dam was in danger of breaking, it was a couple years ago, they evacuated and relocated thousands of people downstream to protect them so they would not be in harm's way. We were not relocated. We were not evacuated. We were imprisoned. We were incarcerated. And so the, the government's use of the word relocation and evacuation was completely uh, wrong. One of the most common terms used today is the word internment camp. Now, uh, this word has been used so much that I think it's lost its uh, real meaning for most people. Besides, we have uh, student interns, we have medical interns. An internee is, is technically a, um, a, an enemy alien of the country that, with which we are at war. Two-thirds of the 120,000 of us who were in prison were Americans. We were American citizens, not aliens. So we were not in an internment camp. Uh, the Department of Justice did have internment camps for aliens. But we were Americans, so we were not in an internment camp. We were in a concentration camp. Our friend Dr. Kashima of the University of Washington told us, whoever controls the vocabulary controls the narrative. And our government controlled the uh, narrative, the vocabulary for so many years they, that they also told the wrong narrative. And we're reminded that those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. So Marilyn and I, um, tell what's happened in the past lest we forget and are condemned to repeat it. Most people think that when Japan bombed our country, that's when all of a sudden there was this anti-Japanese sentiment. Not true. Did you know that for 40 years, beginning in early 1900, there was a concerted effort to get rid of all the Japanese people living on the West Coast, not from Hawaii. Hawaii had like 158,000 people of Japanese ancestry living there, but only on the West Coast. There was this concerted effort to get rid of every Japanese living there. For example, in 1905, the Asiatic Exclusion League was formed in San Francisco with 67 organizations with a membership of almost 100,000. And their sole purpose was to get rid of every Japanese person living on the West Coast. 
And then there were uh, laws passed, such as the uh, alien land law, which prevented any immigrant from Japan of purchasing any property here uh, in our country. In 1915, even the Hearst newspapers had uh, series of articles on getting rid of every Japanese. And then finally, Congress passed the Asian Exclusion Act in 1924 to stop all immigration from Japan. But did you know by the end of 1941, 42% of all the commercial crop, truck crops were, were being grown by Japanese American farmers, almost one fourth of our nation's total. 90% of all the vegetables in California were, were being grown by Japanese American farmers. So this effort for 40 years to get rid of the Japanese um, competition um, was failing. But when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, it was a perfect opportunity to exploit the fears and the hysteria of war to get rid of us by saying that we were loyal to Japan and not to our beloved America. During World War II years, there were 18 Americans who were uh, arrested. None of them were of Japanese American ancestry. So 1942 was also an election year our famous civil rights champion of the 1960s, Chief Justice Earl Warren, was campaigning to be governor of California in 1942. And this is what he testified. The very fact that the Japanese people had not committed any crime is proof that they will when the right time comes. You follow that logic, don't you? The fact that you haven't done anything wrong is proof that you're going to do it. Well, he got his votes. He was elected governor of California in 1942. Without any due process, without any trials, General DeWitt rounded up 120,000 Americans <coughs> and legal residents and declared us a national security. This is General uh, Dallas Emmons of Hawaii. He refused to follow General DeWitt's <coughs> racist order. And so, um, just a few leaders of the Japanese community of uh, Hawaii were in prison. I want to tell you about these. Um, let's see, is that my phone? Okay, uh, about these three brave Americans who uh, defied General DeWitt's orders and they uh, refused to comply. But they were all arrested and convicted and put in prison. All three of them appealed their conviction before the U.S. Supreme Court, but they all lost their cases. I want to tell you about Fred Korematsu on the far right. Uh, his trial before the US, U.S. Supreme Court was in 1944. Uh, Peter Irons, a legal historian, went to the government archives in 1980 to look up the government files on, on uh, Korematsu's uh, trial. He was given a box that said Korematsu. He opened it, and in the top manila folder was a memo a memo from the Justice Department lawyer, lawyer Edward Ennis to his, um, uh, to the Solicitor General, this fellow here. Our top U.S. attorney who defends our government before the Supreme Court. What they wanted to do was, <clears throat> uh, two Justice Department lawyers wanted uh, Charles Fahey to have the, the uh, facts when he argued before the Supreme Court <clears throat> to defend General DeWitt and his, uh, his order that the Japanese were spying and sabotaging. And so they asked the intelligence agencies to 
give them the report so they could uh, pass it on to this, uh, their top attorney. When they got the report, they were shocked. It was the very opposite of what they had anticipated. The FBI director, the, the FCC chair, the uh, Naval Intelligence, and all the other agencies categorically denied that the Japanese Americans had committed any wrong, and they opposed the mass incarceration. But the outcry of the anti-Japanese voices in the 42 drowned out their, uh, uh, the truth. But this is the memo that was given to our top U.S. attorney. <clears throat> we are in possession of information that shows that the War Department's report on the internment is a lie. And we have an ethical obligation not to lie to the Supreme Court. And we must decide whether to correct that record. And so what do you think our top U.S. attorney did with this memo? Nothing. He just threw it aside. Instead, he testified before the U.S. Supreme Court that every syllable, every word of General DeWitt's order was true and accurate, which was a big lie. The War Department wanted uh, <coughs> General DeWitt to submit his final report in manuscript form, but instead he printed 10 hard copies of his report that made him look good and, and expressed his personal views. And when the War Department read it, they were shocked because it was uh, written with racist remarks and with contrary ideas, and so they had to clean it up. And they cleaned it up, and then they had General DeWitt sign it. He said, that's not my report. He said, well, then you don't have a report. So he was forced to sign it, and it's this revised cleanup edition that our US, uh, a top US attorney used before the Supreme Court. And because of the, uh, this misconduct of our government and other uh, cases, uh, Frederick Korematsu appealed his conviction again before the Zero, uh, federal uh, court in San Francisco, and I was able to attend that trial, the courtroom was packed. And Judge Marilyn Patel, after hearing the, the lawyers from both sides give their case, <clears throat> ordered a recess. And she said, after I reconvene, I'll give you my verdict. I remember the courtroom was dead silent, waiting for her to reconvene. And when she did, she had harsh words for the government lawyers for withholding evidence from the Supreme Court, for destroying evidence, and for lying to the Supreme Court justices, and she vacated Korematsu's conviction, and eventually the other two convictions were also overturned. A few years ago, uh, these lawyers from Fort Korematsu were in Fresno, and one of the lawyers heard that I was at that trial, so the lawyer said, you were there. Uh, but, uh, tell me how you felt when the courtroom erupted with uh, shouts of victory. I said, gee, I don't remember that, but I do remember this overwhelming feeling I had that for the first time I was hearing with my own ears a representative of my government saying that we were put into these concentration camps for up to four years on a lie by General DeWitt and our government. In 1983, uh, Congress established a Congressional Commission to investigate how such a tragedy could happen in our great democracy. And after their investigation, their report came out in this personal justice denied. <clears throat> and in it, it states, unhappily, the false claims and stories on the West Coast in 42 made respectable opinion. The old prejudicial propaganda 
and of the anti-Japanese faction, unopposed, had won the day. And the conclusion of the investigation was this. The promulgation of Executive Order 9066 was not justified by military necessity, were not driven by analysis of military conditions. The broad historical causes which shaped these decisions were race prejudice, war hysteria, and failure of political <coughs> leadership. And I add for emphasis, organized self-interest groups with their prejudice and economic greed since the early 1900s, exploiting the fears and hysteria of World War II, spreading lies and rumors that the Japanese Americans were loyal to Japan and dangerous, hoping finally to get rid of all the Japanese living on the West Coast. I'm going to, con <clears throat> I'm going to conclude this part of uh, our presentation with memoirs of our nation's leaders who supported General DeWitt. Justice William Douglas said, it was ever on my conscience. Milton Eisenhower described the force removal as an inhuman mistake. Uh, Milton was a brother of our president, Dwight Eisenhower. In March of 1942, he was appointed director of all the 10 concentration camps. Three months later, he resigned, saying, I was sick of the job, and I had a hard time sleeping at night. I think he listened to his conscience. Here is Chief Justice Earl Warren's memoir. While he was still living, we asked him to recant. But I was told that he was so emotionally upset that he, he couldn't uh, respond. But in his 1977 memoir, he writes, I have since deeply regretted the removal order and my own testimony advocating it because it was not in keeping with our American concept of freedom and the rights of citizens. Whenever I thought of the innocent children who were torn from home, school friends, and congenial surroundings, I was conscience stricken. It was wrong to react so impulsively without positive evidence of disloyalty. I appreciated his, his uh, writing this in his memoir, but I wondered why didn't he mention the adults? The adults lost their jobs, they lost their homes, they lost their farms, they lost their career, and those who were still in the prison camps in 1945 and released, they were given $25 and a one-way ticket to somewhere. Many had nowhere to go because we had only like 48 hours to two weeks to get rid of everything we own here on the West Coast. And so like 30,000 uh, went to Chicago area to start from scratch. Supreme Court Justice Tom Clark said, looking back on it today, it was a mistake. A mistake? I call it a crime. 120,000 innocent Americans and legal residents were imprisoned by our government for up to four years on a lie by General DeWitt and our War Department. I'm going to have one of uh, General DeWitt's non-aliens share with you her personal story, my, my wife, Marion. Thank you. I am a survivor of America's concentration camp. My citizenship didn't mean anything, and our Constitution was reduced to a scrap of paper. We Americans living in what, on the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, California, and Southern Arizona were uprooted from our homes and put into 16 temporary detention centers, and our family was detained and incarcerated on the Salinas Rodeo grounds. Most of us children were under 21 years of age 
We had no power, no voice, and no one to advocate for us. Here is a graphic photo of a second grade class where there were many Japanese students. Overnight, we disappeared from our homes, our schools, and our community. Before I share my part of the story, I need to help you to understand the Japanese culture the way Sabro and I were raised. And these are the words that were instilled in us, and it's still with us today. Haji, I am not to bring shame, disgrace, or dishonor on my family, my community, and country. Gaman, I am to endure, persevere with patience, dignity, and fortitude. In other words, we're to suck it up and take it. Shikataganai, I must accept things as they are when they cannot be changed and just move on with my life. Endio, I am to be reserved, modest, act in humility, and put others first. On, I am to show honor and responsibility, a sense of grateful obligation, and most of all, a debt of gratitude to family, community, and country. Kodomo no tame, for the sake of the children, protect them from negative experience and attitudes. Our cultural traits had us showing a smiling face on the outside, hiding our feelings. My father was an immigrant from Japan. My mother was born in Salinas, California. They were successful truck farmers and doing very well financially. They had to, they had a big family to support. It was a matter of survival. They were at the height of their earning ability in 1941 when they were sent to the, uh, detained. I was nine years old at the time. We did not know where we were going, how long we would be gone. And so my mother, packing for our family, which allowed only two bags per person, that was all that we could take with us. So my mother, planning ahead, sacrificed one duffel bag and stuffed it full with Kotex pads in preparation for my sister and me. We were given name tags because we would, with numbers on us, because we would not be known by our name anymore. We would be known by our number. And we could easily get lost because the barracks all looked alike. Our government hurriedly built these temporary barracks to detain us and on the rodeo grounds in Salinas. And we were there for about two and a half months. And then we were loaded onto dilapidated old trains that hadn't been used for years. And then transferred to a more permanent concentration camp in Poston, Arizona. Now coming from Salinas, which is very, very cool weather, we arrived in Poston, Arizona, where it was 120 degrees. This is an aerial view of Poston camp. We had dust storms so thick that we had to cover our uh, eyes and our breathing. Our family of eight lived in one room, 20 by 25 feet, no partitions, no privacy, and it just barely had room for our family, just the cots that we slept on. We had to line up to eat in the mess hall, rain or shine. Because my father was a cook and my mother was the dietitian, preparing meals for the sick, the new mothers, and the diabetics. That meant that our family never ate as a family the whole time we were there. So family life was never the same after that, and especially we brothers and sisters, there were eight of us children, 
We were never close after that. This is our friend, Judy Sugita de Quieros. She was eight years old when she was in Poston, and after the war, she became an artist, and she painted from memory her life in camp. And these are two of her pictures that she painted. Uh, the bathroom <coughs> scene, which was where they had no partition, and so it was extremely embarrassing and hard uh, to take for us women going to the bathroom. And not only that, the showers. There simply was no privacy whatsoever. This is my sixth grade class. You can see the barracks on the left and on the right. I was a Girl Scout for a short time. My mother had a baby in camp, so my sister below me helped with the baby and I did all the family laundry and ironing by scrub board and rinsing two times. I did not have much time to play with other children for I was 10 years old. One day, my sister's friend invited both of us to her barrack uh, for the night. And in the night, her father molested me. And I was so traumatized that no voice would come from my mouth. And I was not able to talk about this to anyone, let alone not tell my mother before she passed away. So my whole experience being in a concentration camp was very traumatic. I was made to feel that I started a war. I was made to feel that being a Japanese was bad. I felt a hurt I couldn't explain and I didn't know how to fight back. I felt hate and it didn't feel, feel good. I was in the eighth grade when we were released and my family found out that all our uh, family goods that we had stored and left behind was all looted and just not uh, usable anymore. It's just, it was all lost. So we had nothing <coughs> and we had to start our life all over again from scratch. And so that meant us children had to work after school. And at the time, uh, I worked as a maid for two homes after school for 50 cents an hour. Another thing that was very painful was that no one would rent to us. It was very difficult to find um, housing for us. So we temporarily stayed in churches, the Buddhist temple and the Japanese Christian church. After one year living in Watsonville, we moved to San Jose where my mother found an abandoned house. That was all she could find for us. And it was smelly and it was terrible, but we had to endure it and take it. So we lived there for a short time and then we moved on to a, an apricot shed with no, with just a roof on it and we used the trays, apricot trays, to all around it to make a temporary housing for us. We had a job. On this, on this orchard. So that's how difficult it was for us to find housing. My saving grace was uh, during my high school years, because I had worked, um, I told my mother when we moved to San Jose that uh, I'll, I'll work as a maid going to uh, a school at the same time. So during my junior high school years, high school and two years of college was all I could do. Uh, I would be a live-in maid working in Caucasian homes and going to school at the same time. But my saving grace was the first day of high school, I met an Italian girl and she had lost her mother and had moved recently to uh, San Jose from Scranton, Pennsylvania. And she needed a friend the first day of school and I needed a friend and so we became very good friends. And she invited me to live with her family on the weekends when I had day off. And her family treated with me with love and generosity and kindness. 
and restored my faith in humanity. And I am grateful that I learned at this time that there are good people in this world also. So in closing, I want to share two experiences of discrimination and prejudice. The first was I went to work in San Francisco after two years of college, and I needed a temporary, uh, I mean, a, a second job to support myself. So I went to interview at Milton Mann Photography Studio, and he wanted me to do a telephone solicitation. And uh, so I did it with enthusiasm, and I did a good one. But he said to me, your so voice, your name sounds too foreign, so I want you to use a Caucasian name. So I used Miss Grant, and by the time I finished the interview, I, I, I was so angry. I had no words for Mr. Mann, and I grabbed my purse, glared at him, and I left. The second uh, experience was I was now married and had three little children, and I had to be home at school for my youngest daughter, who, would be, who was handicapped, and had to come home early on the bus, so I had to be home to receive her. And so I went to work at an elementary school as a community aide, working with parents. And one day the principal said to me, uh, I want you to do the secretary's job too. And I said, by now I'm smart. And I said, that's not in my job description. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he looked at me real mean, and he said, you do it, because I tell you to do it. And the superintendent of the schools told me to tell you to, to do it. And I said, oh, okay. And I left, and I headed for that superintendent's office, and I got in right away. And I said, why didn't you tell me? I have to do the secretary's job, too. And he got on the phone, and dialed Mr. Potter and said to Mr. Potter, don't you dare use my name like that again. Well, how do you think I felt then? I felt power hit me, just like that. It just overwhelmed me. And I said to myself, wow, I have been giving my power away all this time. I got my power back, and I got my voice back. And this power has enabled me to go to schools and share my personal painful, shameful story with you because now I have a voice. And I thank you for listening because you are a part of my healing. And I am strong and I am a survivor. Thank you. These are my three uh, diamonds. I call them my three diamonds, my three children. The one on the uh, far right is the one that, and they're all seniors. Uh, she's, she lives with uh, mental uh, what disabilities. Gosh, words are leaving me. Uh, and she is 54 and she lives in Mission Viejo, 15 minutes away from her sister that's in the middle, and she's here today, and, and uh, she's a retired optometrist. I won't say how, how old she is because she's here today. <laughs> and then my, my oldest is Carice, and she lives with schizophrenia, and she has done so well, uh, and she has gone through so much really in her life, that uh, uh, she has for the last 23 years, 23 years, 24 years, she has lived on her own, in her own apartment in Stockton, California, and she lives a very wonderful, happy life. And so uh, uh, we are grateful for our three diamonds in, in the rough, thank you. We want to give you time to make comments or ask questions, and so be thinking of uh, what you want to share 
after um, a, my brief uh, story and a wrap up. <clears throat> I still remember that Sunday morning, we were working on our newly purchased farm because my sister reached 21 and we were able to buy our first farm uh, under her name. And we took a break since we were working near the house, turned on the radio and relaxing when all of a sudden the program was interrupted with a news flash. Japan is bombing Pearl Harbor. I remember saying, what a stupid thing Japan is doing. Who do they think they are bombing our country? And then within a couple of weeks, these anti-Japanese factions were saying that we helped Japan bomb Pearl Harbor, that we were loyal to Japan and not to our beloved America. And then rumors were going around, uh, round up all the Japs and put them in concentration camps. I remember we started to get rid of anything that were Japanese, -y, like magazines or record players or, or pictures and letters. And uh, I remember we uh, buried our 22 rifle that we used for hunting jackrabbits and, um, because we didn't want the FBI uh, wondering, well, what are you doing with this gun in your house? Or, or what are these um, Japanese language newspapers doing in your house? But I'll never forget May 16, 1942. That was the day of the West Coast relays at Fresno State. And uh, I was hoping that my favorite star would break his world record in pole vaulting, uh, Cornelius Warmerdam from Hanford, who was a student here at Fresno State. And uh, I never found out because the army truck drove into the farm, our farmhouse, and all nine of us piled in. And we were taken to the Fresno Fairgrounds, which was a place of uh, highlighting the riches of our valley <coughs> and a place of fun, but had suddenly been turned into a prison with guard towers full of um, the barracks that uh, over 5,000 of us were imprisoned in. There's an aerial view of the fairgrounds. Those, those black marks are all barracks an overflow in, on the south of uh, uh, Butler Avenue. We were there for six months, and then we were shipped to Jerome, Arkansas, the swamp lands of um, southeast Arkansas. And the government said that these were our new pioneer communities with more jobs, more room, and um, propaganda like that. 21 days after we arrived there, the weather turned extremely cold. It started to snow. We had no heat in our barracks yet. And my father caught pneumonia, and he died in a makeshift uh, hosp uh, barrack hospital. And that's in a picture of our funeral service. Some of our relatives could not attend, of course, because they were in some other concentration camps in other states. During World War II, 33,000 Japanese Americans served our country. 13,500 volunteered or were recruited from behind our concentration camps. 6,000 of these soldiers served in the military intelligence service. Can you imagine we who were imprisoned there because we were dangerous, were being ser serving our country in the intelligence service? And General MacArthur's staff said that because of the uh, interpretation of these uh, Japanese American soldiers who could intercept the, the Japan's orders to their uh, army during the war, that we knew more about what was going on on their side than we knew uh, in any other war. And they said that the war was shortened by at least two years because of this uh, service of the military intelligence. 
service. In 1944, the Army came into our camps to recruit more soldiers that were badly needed. 361 of the young men said, restore our citizenship rights, free us from these concentration camps, and we will be proud to serve our country. The government put them in federal penitentiaries for up to three years. <coughs> in 1942, we had a lawyer who was to challenge the government's unconstitutional uh, imprisonment of all of us. And so he was looking for a, a plaintiff and he selected this uh, Mitsue, Mitsue Endo of Sacramento. She, she was a secretary working for this state, but she was fired and put into the concentration camp. And so the, the trial was uh, postponed. And finally, in 1944, in December, the U.S. Supreme Court heard her case. And the Supreme Court unanimously uh, voted that it was uh, illegal for the government to put us in prison. But the day before the, the Supreme Court could announce its uh, decision, President Roosevelt heard about it and he closed all the camps uh, starting January 2, 1945 to save any embarrassment for the government. When the camps were closed, those in the camps were given $25 and a ticket to somewhere and 75% um, of all the lucrative Farm farms of the Japanese Americans were lost and never recovered. In 1945, my family was finally released after three long years in the two camps in Arkansas. And we were so grateful to the Sorensen brothers and Ted and Ellie Nielsen for saving our home and our farm. And we were among the few who, who had people like that uh, some of your uh, uh, relatives or friends may have uh, done the same thing. And, but th those who helped us were known as Jap lovers, but they were the true Americans. I want to tell you about my sister, Aiko. When we came back in 1945 in April, uh, I was a freshman in high school and she was a senior ready to graduate. And she was a straight A student. All the seniors were asked to come to the principal's office to have their cap and gown measurement. And so she excitedly went with her classmates. But when she got there, the principal took her aside and said, we decided we don't want any Japs on our graduation, so you can't graduate here. She felt like she was slapped in her face. She was so stunned that she didn't tell the rest of the family that this had happened. But the same day, she got a tele, uh, telegram uh, offering her a job in, a, in Watsonville. And so she quit school and grabbed a Greyhound bus and went to her new job. But the same high school, uh, 13 years later, was it? Um, the, the graduating class and the new and the, uh, the principal uh, heard about what happened to my sister and they uh, had a, a, uh, a special graduation for all the Japanese American uh, students who were not able to graduate there because they were in prison and uh, they marched with cap and gown and my sister's uh, oldest daughter who happened to be home from a uh, uh, sabbatical from Japan uh, stood and accepted her di diploma uh, 61 years later. Because of the civil liberty, um, uh, excuse me, uh, because of the Congressional Commission's uh, investigation in 1980s, uh, Congress passed the Civil Liberty Act of 1988 which required our president to send a letter of 
apology to all of us who are still living and a redress check of 20,000, which I call a token penalty check for the crime that our government committed. People asked, well, what was it like to be in prison during the World War II? And it's hard for me to answer that because unless you go through it, how do you explain, explain the trauma? But several years ago, I was interviewing our dear friend, Chaplain George Aki, who was one of the four chaplains of the famous uh, all, all segregated Japanese American uh, unit called the 442nd, the most highly decorated uh, military unit in US military history for its size and length of service. And I said, George, what do you, what do you remember about 1940, uh, 41? And he said, well, when the rumors are going around that we would all be rounded up and put into concentration camp, I was telling everyone, that's not going to happen. This is America. America doesn't do things like that. Not only that, we're Americans. So that'll, that'll never happen. Two days before he was to graduate to, from uh, his theological school to become a pastor, uh, he and his young wife was imprisoned at the Tanforan uh, Detention Center. And he said when the gates closed behind him, my faith in America died, my faith in God died, and I died. And when, he, when I heard him say that, it resonated deep within me because that's how we all felt. We loved our country. We respected our country. We were so devoted as Americans. And then all of a sudden, we were looked upon as enemies and dangerous. I use the metaphor of incest to help convey the trauma we experienced. Like children, we loved our country. We honored our country. And the one we loved and honored so much, so deeply, was suddenly violating us. And we felt the humiliation, the guilt, the shame that we could only bury because we had no one to advocate for us. Like my wife said, the majority of us were children and our parents, were de uh, those who were immigrants, were denied citizenship because of racist uh, 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 laws. And so most of my generation have never talked about it. And, um, my wife are, and I are among the minority who have been willing to, to share this story lest we forget and be condemned to repeat it. Today we're hearing echoes of what happened in 1942. And we don't want it to happen again. We have the Islamophobia accusing people because of their faith and because of their, of their um, uh, ethnicity of being dangerous and disloyal. And we want to share with you that this is our history of America and we need to remember it and not repeat it again. When we make, a, uh, make the pledge to our flag, we pledge it with liberty and justice for all, and we need to live up to that. So thank you for this privilege of uh, sharing our story, and then uh, you're welcome to make comments and raise questions. Okay, Mary. <laughs> You could ask anything you want, so don't hesitate. And I'm hard of hearing, so my wife is going to be my ears. Um, was there a uh, louder? Louder. Oh. Was there anybody in the camps that tried to like escape? 
Oh no, like I said, we obey. Ooh. Like I said, we obey. Well, our culture oh. taught us to respect authority and to keep the law and all that. So, so the, the administration of the camps were all amazed how easy it was for them to, 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 to uh, administer the camps. But that was our culture to be. I mean, there's a lot of questions right there. I mean, young man, right, right there. Okay. Music just to keep music has a thing has a habit of keeping people up whenever they're down. So while you guys were in the right, while you guys were in the camp, did you listen to any music or any famous artists that you liked? Uh, well, uh, our the elders in the camp they kept us busy. We had girls' calls, boys' calls, baseball, basketball. Uh, I lived right in front of the a basketball court. So I saw some games and I love basketball to this day. Um, uh, the, there were arts and crafts, uh, people who were good at it, so they taught one another. So uh, we were kept busy. And uh, uh, our Japanese culture was practiced in, in the camps, which was amazing. Yes, yes, over there. What kind of food did you guys eat? Food? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, uh, food that we're not used to eating because we, we eat our rice, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I remember um, uh, uh, Wheaties, pancakes, uh, 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 apple, butter. apple butter, never had that before in my life, um, uh, l uh, l uh, uh, Orange marmalade and uh, uh, lamb, mutton, mutton stew. Uh, Japanese people, we, we never ate lamb or I mean, what we, lamb chops or we never ate that before in our life. So uh, that was something that we're not used to. You want to tell your well, mutton I, stew? I, I was brought up on a farm, so I ate everything. <laughs> it didn't me, but the one meal of all the meals I ate during those three years, there's one meal I'll never forget. That's the only meal I remember. We had mutton stew, and we all got diarrhea, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So while you guys were at this camp, did you guys have gaps between your education level and your camp? No. You, you know, Japanese people uh, revere education. And so when we got into the camps, uh, the, the, the older ones uh, in their 20s or even younger, uh, they, they um, had programs for uh, children <coughs> and uh, uh, organized uh, schools as quick as possible, uh, we, although we didn't have books and papers and pencils. As a matter of fact, I have a story to share. Um, they opened up canteens later on, and, and I had no uh, notebook or pencil to, to write, and I wanted to write, and because my experience, I wanted to write my experience in camp. And so I went to the canteen, and I stole a notebook, and, because I had no money. And so as I was walking out, the clerk was following me, and she said to me, if you return the notebook, I won't tell your mother so that ended my life of crime. <laughs> it nipped it in a bud. Um, I have two questions. First, um, when you guys experienced, did that shape the way you like maybe raised your children? I mean, did you raise your, did you raise your children in fear of this can happen to them again? Or were you guys okay with everything and raising them the way you guys wanted? That's a good question. And second, how did we raise you? <laughs> <laughs> did we raise you okay? <laughs> you guys are so busy. You know, you have so much going on. <laughs> second, you said that you were molested in camp, and I, I'm so sorry for that. Um, did it continue to happen, or was that a one-time thing, like where you visit a friend and then you never went back, or did you? 
you know, did it keep happening and no one knew about it or? Me? Yeah. Oh, I, you, I don't, I don't get the you, question. You, you stated in your, um, and what happened to you in camp that you were molested uh -huh. by your friend's father. Did that continue to keep happening or oh, was it a one No time? way, no way. I, I, I avoided him uh, and uh, uh, for years I saw his face. Uh, and uh, it was it was part of my, you know, ongoing memory, and and uh, I just had to work it out myself, which which I was able to do so many years later. And it was at the Tule Lake pilgrimage where we went to see what uh, the stories that people told that were incarcerated. Uh, Tule Lake was one of the worst prison camps. And so, because it was a, they had a, a prison within a prison. And so, um, we went to learn more about it. And it was there that, um, it was about, I would say a good 10 years ago that I said, I don't see his face anymore. And so, uh, I was able to work it out. And, and uh, it was because I was telling my story to students that I was uh, molested, and going to high schools and and just telling and telling and telling, and finally it was no longer here, and it was out. So I I was able to uh, re-educate myself, you might say. <laughs> I'd like to also say that this happened in camp over and over. I'm not the only one that it happened to. You can, you can be sure of that. And I think there was a question. I think we have time for one more question. I, Somebody has. Well, you better tell it quick because. What's that question? How did we meet? Oh. <laughs> Because of, <clears throat> because of time, I get the short version. I was also a student pastor at a, at a church in Watsonville uh, on the weekends while I was going to a theological school across the Gold Gate Bridge. My roommate uh, and I went to San Francisco and he double parked for me so that I could pick up some Sunday school material for my weekend uh, church work. So uh, I ran up this Board of Christian Education building in uh, San Francisco to pick up my material, and when I got there, unknown to me, she was working there. I didn't know her. I picked her up instead. <laughs> That's a wonderful story, isn't it? <laughs> well, apparently it worked because this year we will be married 63 years. All right. Thank you.